Sean Connery chasing a drug dealer in the outer space thriller Outland. One of four new movies we'll be reviewing this week on sneak previews across the aisle for me, Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. And across the aisle for me is Gene Sisko, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. Well, in addition to Outland, we'll also be reviewing Death Hunt, the new action adventure starring Charles Bronson and Lee Marvin, and Take This Job and Shove It, based on the country song of the same name. But first, Gene starts with the story of the daring and resourceful masked rider of the plane. Right. Well, this is one is an easy film to review. The Legend of the Lone Ranger is one of the worst movies of the year. It fails totally as a Western, <laughs> as an adventure film, and as a children's entertainment. This is the version of the Lone Ranger story that caused all the commotion about a year and a half ago when the producers of the film wanted to disassociate the old Lone Ranger, actor Clayton Moore, from their new film. Well, lucky Clayton Moore. In the story, the young ranger, played by Clinton Spilsbury, you'll notice I didn't call him actor Clinton Spilsbury, <laughs> he's raised by the Indians after losing his parents. An Indian brave named Tonto befriends him and offers to help during the target practice. Maybe you need a bigger target, like a sleeping buffalo. Try this. A silver bullet. It's more accurate. <laughs> Tribal chiefs first use silver on their arrows. Makes them fly longer and straighter. Silver is pure. It's been a symbol of justice and purity since the year of the sun. Gee, that's a new one. I didn't realize that the reason that the Lone Ranger uses silver bullets is because he's a bad shot. <laughs> the film is badly acted and horribly paced. It takes a full hour before we ever see the Lone Ranger in his costume with the mask and everything. That was a stupid decision. The Lone Ranger in costume should have been the centerpiece of this movie. We should have seen him sooner. And when the Lone Ranger finally does arrive, he's involved in a silly adventure. A crazed Texan wants to run his own territory separate from the United States to get what he wants, he kidnaps President Ulysses Grant, played by Jason Robards, but to the rescue, the Lone Ranger and Tato. <sighs> Mr. President. <sighs> Excuse me, sir. Huh? Right now. We're here to help. You don't look like someone could help me, and neither does he. Here's a gun. Trust us, sir. We're going to get you out of here. This way. Light the fuses. safer here, Mr. President. Yeah, but I can help you. I've been in a few battles myself, son. Now you're a president, so keep your head down. Ah! 
what more can I say about this movie? It indicts itself. Except to say that I think it's going to provide a great trivia question for the 1990s. <laughs> Not who was that masked man, but who played him? The answer, Clinton Spilsbury. You know, while I was watching this movie, at first I thought, gee, maybe the problem is that I've grown up. I'm not a kid anymore. Then I realized the problem was the filmmakers had grown up and they weren't kids anymore. And they're trying to, they took this material and they tried to dignify it for the first hour with this great, the origins of the Lone Ranger. Yeah. And all of this tremendous dignity and this solemnity and so forth. Mm -hmm. It's like the beginning of Superman before Superman really took off. But here, it's an hour of all of this stuff. And then when they finally get to the Lone Ranger and they play the William Tell Overture and everybody cheers, then we get a character who is nothing like the guy that we liked on radio and television. Right. The real Lone Ranger hated violence, and this guy, here he is setting off dynamite, yeah. blowing people up, pulling out of the I think that's a very good point. I think that parents, uh, the film isn't going to play very long, let's no, face it, it's bombing so. all right. over the country. Um, but I think that parents will really be disappointed, as will their children, mm -hmm. because I think this is a film that a lot of kids were looking forward to, and it really is quite mm -hmm. violent. As, needlessly so, as you point out, that wasn't the character of the Lone Ranger. Also, I still can't get over the stupidity of the decision to make it one hour before the William Tell Overture and we see this guy ride and off. Before that's the Lone Ranger gets involved. It should have been, uh, it, uh, despite the fact that it's filled with violence, we should add it's very slowly paced. Right. And it should have been breakneck right out of the uh, starting gate. It just should have been... How about having a sense of humor of the character? You know, enjoying the presentation of this character. You don't get it right. from the actor, Clinton no. Spilsbury. You don't get it from the filmmakers or the director. You know, in Superman, Superman, remember at the beginning of Superman, he looks at the one phone booth and he can't... Uh, right. It's a modern phone booth, so he can't change his clothes in right. there. There should have been a little humor in this one with the Lone Ranger's mask. You know, as that if anybody is going to be fooled by that 2% of his face being no covered No humor up. and a slow start. Right, a real disappointing movie. Let's go on to a couple of other Western legends, Charles Bronson and Lee Marvin. <laughs> These are two men whose faces have taken on such character over the years, they almost look like weathered bronze sculptures <laughs> instead of members of the Actors mm -hmm. Guild. Their faces and their absolutely unshakable screen personas are the two best things about Death Hunt, a boring thriller that consists almost entirely of the slowest chasing in history <laughs> as everybody slogs north to Alaska through knee-deep snow. Bronson plays a touchy and independent Canadian trapper who's killed a man in self-defense in a fight, and Lee Marvin is the sheriff who comes to arrest him. Johnson! This is Edgar Millen, the Royal Canadian Police, talking to you. I don't want any trouble. I don't want to see nobody else get hurt. I'm coming in to talk to you. Now hear me out. savages out here, just aching to splatter you all over the place. They don't want your side told. Now, if you don't come in with me, that's all the excuse they'll need. They'll either kill you or get themselves killed trying. I can't let that happen. You can't stop it. Bronson is known as a man of few words on the screen, but I think this movie sets a record. Right there in that scene, you literally heard about half of Bronson's total dialogue in the whole movie, and almost everything else he has to say, he says to his dog. He spends the rest of the film running and shooting and jumping across raging torrents. Bronson somehow survives that last shootout. He straps on his snowshoes, and he tries to escape to the north. Marvin leads the posse that chases him, and the whole movie is just that chase. The real conflict is between Bronson, who wants to be let alone, and Lee Marvin, who knows it's his duty to capture Bronson, but still secretly he thinks to himself, well, I'd do the same thing if I were in his snowshoes. <laughs> I admire both of them in this movie. I enjoyed the texture of the Marvin and Bronson performances, and I appreciated the way they held their own, even in a movie that, unfortunately, is as tired and unsurprising as this one. Just once, recent years, I think, Bronson and Marvin deserve a better script. I agree with you, absolutely. Uh, Bronson and Marvin are kind of interesting. I wish the whole movie had been about just them, but this movie is saddled with a whole bunch of supporting characters. They mm -hmm. get a, mm -hmm. an awful lot of screen time, which I think wrecks the story, plus, as you say, the 
chase is so drawn out. Uh, the premise is sort of stupid, I really think. Uh, Bronson is accused of murdering a guy, but he did it, obviously, in self-defense, and mm -hmm. we see that. It's not off camera. We see that Bronson was right, okay? And everybody else sees it, too. And, and Marvin knows it's right, too. So I question Marvin's motivation. He's sort of just going along. But then you got all these creeps that are going after him, the guys that actually start shooting him in that scene. And, well, it, it's an open and shut case. We don't care about this story. Bronson's character is perfectly legitimate. Bronson's best characters have been like in uh, Death, Death, Wish, Death Wish, where he has a cause. Mr. Majestic, he's uh -huh. a farm laborer being abused. He has a cause. This isn't a cause. This is he's being picked on by the, idiots. He's the Avenger instead of the guy who's running away. Well, he's just been Another thing by I idiots. didn't like about the movie. I think you're right. If they had just simplified it to Bronson and Marvin and had this simple chase, could have taken on a kind sure. of grandeur. But as a matter of fact, they clutter it up with all these supporting performances. Angie Dickinson what is, is Marvin's doing? girlfriend for a while, then she disappears from the movie. Mm -hmm. Andy Stevens comes in as a Mountie. He has no function. Then the guy comes in in the biplane. He's going <laughs> to shoot down uh, Charles Bronson from the air. Yeah. That's ridiculous. We're constantly being distracted from this basic conflict between the two men. Yeah, a, a big mistake in casting. Why all these extra roles? Mm -hmm. I didn't get it. Our next film, though, is a pleasant surprise. It's a workers' rebellion comedy, sort of a male version of 9 to 5 that works surprisingly well because it takes his story seriously. The film is Take This Job and Shove It, based on the 1977 country tune by Johnny Paycheck. The film stars Robert Hayes from the movie Airplane as a young executive sent back to his hometown by the boss of his corporate conglomerate to improve the profits of a new acquisition, a small brewery in Dubuque, Iowa. Fellow executive Martin Mull tries to offer some advice to Hayes. You can only fake it for so long. I thought you just got yourself at the Duke Star Brewery. Yeah, old man Pickett finally broke down. Mm -hmm. And God's gift to women better have his body in Iowa by Friday, or its soul is on welfare on Monday. Read it and weep. Four weeks to deliver a 50% production increase. Look, Dubuque is my hometown. I can't go back there like some corporate hatchet man and make over that brewery in four weeks. The old man is building generals, not buck privates. This is a test, my fair-haired wonder boy. I've done a hell of a job for this company. Why am I being dumped on? Dumped on? This is the biggie. I like that scene a lot. It's sort of surprising. The two men walking into their offices, sort of trapped into their offices. Robert Hayes looking uncomfortable in his suit. That's not the kind of strong scene you expect to see in a summertime movie. The best part of the movie is that the script, I think, cares enough about Robert Hayes' character to make him really squirm in trying to decide the priorities of his life. To whom does he owe his allegiance? To his hometown brewery buddies or to the corporate carrot? A bigger job, a bigger salary, which his boss is dangling in front of his nose. The issue comes to a head after Hayes is at the new brewery. He's increased production dramatically, and that pleases the conglomerate's boss, who has now turned around and is about to resell the brewery to a wealthy Texan. Hayes has been used, and that explains why his foul mouth anger confronts the Texan, Charlie Rich, when he comes to tour the brewery. How'd you like to be president of works, huh? Oh, Billy Boy, if you come on here, who knows what you're doing? Because God knows, he doesn't know both. I'm wrong. Frank, I think Frank's had a few of them already himself. Can I talk to you for a second, Frank? It's kind of important. Hey, don't go away, Frank, Billy Boy. Frank. I'll be right back. Huh? Frank, <laughs> you want to spend the rest of your life in a trailer? Well, I don't. Uh -huh. I don't know if you've lost your mind completely. Hey, 2,000. Let's get it up to 2,500. Come on, we can What the hell is he talking Woo! Hey, you. Those two scenes of the movie in a nutshell, a surprisingly good mix of slapstick comedy and some genuine drama. Take This Job and Shove It is not a great movie, but it is an unexpected delight among summertime films. It's a lot better than it has to be, and by that I mean a summertime comedy about workers' rebellion could be just beer bottles being broken. This movie, I thought, had a character at the center that was a really interesting guy. Well, I don't agree with you. I didn't think it was very good. I suppose it should get points as the first left-wing exploitation, good old boy, populist movie. But the fact is, I couldn't think they could decide what they wanted to do. 
Part of the time they're talking about the issues, you have the conglomerate coming in, the right. rest of the time it's a bedroom romp with a three-way love triangle. Mm -hmm. Then it's kind of uh, National Lampoon's brewery uh, house or something with everybody pouring beer on each other and spraying each other with hoses. You didn't well, I mean, obviously, what I'm saying is it had, yes, all those elements that you yeah, just named, uh -huh. and, and it did them well, I thought. In other no. words, I thought that the, that the guy, I was really f caught up with this guy, the poor guy mm -hmm. who makes it out of a small town. He's from Dubuque, goes to Minneapolis to the big conglomerate, and then has to come back home. And I felt he was really... I think this guy's a terrific actor. I love actor the story. Too. I mean, in the fact, as you tell me the story, I would like to see that film. I think maybe this movie needed a rewrite because it's so chaotic, it never organizes its elements. Just as soon as you have a scene that makes some kind of a halfway serious point, it goes to complete slapstick and the movie doesn't seem to care seriously about anything. So you didn't think they accomplished the balancing act that I'm saying it obviously did? So we disagree. We disagree. But we I think this is one people ought to take a chance on. Well, I don't. So okay. here's one that I think they should take a chance on. The Legend of the Lone Ranger, which is not the one they should take a chance on, left us wondering if the Western <laughs> was dead. But a new science fiction movie named Outland suggests that the Western is alive and well and living on the moons of Jupiter. <laughs> Outland is set on a space station millions of miles from Earth, but its plot is borrowed directly from High Noon, the classic 1952 mm -hmm. Gary Cooper Western. Both movies use the same basic plot. A U.S. Marshal arrives in an isolated town, takes on the bad guys, and doesn't get any help from the terrified locals. Sean Connery plays the Marshal in Outland, and here he is talking to Francis Sternhagen, the ship's doctor, about a plague of mysterious deaths. Are you Dr. Lazarus? Yes, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. That's a doctor joke. Are you the new marshal? Yes. I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes. I got an alibi. I got four people who swear they were playing poker with me. I've never heard that one before. That's really funny. Sorry. Yesterday, a man deliberately went into the atmosphere without his pressure suit. Yes. A couple of days before that, another man cut his suit open on purpose. It happens here. How often? I don't know. It just happens here. Why? I'm not a psychiatrist. I can't tell you why. Some people just can't take it here after a while. Did you do autopsies? No. Why not? In the first place, the company wanted the body shipped out quickly. In the second place, when a person exposes himself to zero pressure atmosphere, there isn't a whole lot left to inspect. In the third place, you're becoming a nuisance. Yes, I know. I would like a report of all of these incidents that have happened during the past six months. I'd like it really soon, or I might just kick your nasty ass all over this room. That's a martial joke. The doctor there, Francis Sternhagen, is the only person on board that Connery can trust, and they turn out to have a nice relationship together. It turns out from Connery's investigation that the mining company that owns the space station is secretly selling drugs to its own miners to make them work harder, and that every once in a while, the drugs make the workers work just a little too hard, and they want to take a walk outside the space station in zero atmosphere without their spacesuits. That leads to a lot of messy scenes of people exploding. After Connery uncovers the drug ring, he get, goes to the company manager, played by Peter Boyle, who thinks Connery is just fishing for a payoff, a bribe. But Connery already knows that Boyle is the ringleader. Now, every year, a new marshal comes to start his tour. They all know the score. You know the score. You're no different. If this hero routine is to get your price up, I'll think about it. What are you at? You. <laughs> what is it with guys like you? I mean, if you were such a damn super cop, what are you doing on a company mining operation like Isle? They didn't send you here as a reward for your sterling service. You know that, and I know that. I read your record. You got a big mouth. That's why you're sent from one toilet to the next. Me, I don't plan on spending the rest of my life doing this. Well, good for you. Now, look, this radio is just silly. You try and meddle, I want you to know what you're meddling with. You got something to prove, prove it to yourself, not to me. I'll see you around. If you're looking for money, you're smarter than you look. If you're not, you're a lot dumber. I'm probably a lot dumber. Boyle calls in two company hitmen to kill Connery, but the marshal outsmarts this guy with a rifle by stalking him from outside the space station. Thank you. 
Somehow you might think that one of the most experienced hitmen in the universe would know that that would happen when he <laughs> shot off his rifle inside a high-pressure situation, but I guess not. If you remember High Noon, you might recognize that scene, or it might ring a bell for you, the marshal and the out-of-town hitman stalking each other. And Outland also uses another famous gimmick from High Noon, where you see the town clock ticking away the time before the train arrives with mm -hmm. the killer on board. Well, in this case, the space station clock measures the time until the space shuttle arrives with the hired killers on board. Outland has got some good special effects and a spectacular chase scene, but the best thing about it, I thought, was a performance by Sean Connery. He makes an interesting hero. He's tough and stubborn, but he's also complicated and very world-weary, a hero we can identify with. I agree with you. He's the best thing in the movie. He's the only good thing in this movie. Oh, as much as you did, I'll tell you what's wrong. Well, first of all, the okay. hitmen. The villains here, you got a thriller, a good guy, Connery, and the villains. The villains uh -huh. stink in this picture. This, They're real this dumb, yeah. Very dumb. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there really isn't much of a sense of combat. Not only does he do the thing that you just mentioned, also, what about shooting at a shape that doesn't look like a human body at all? How about mm -hmm. this? The two guys get off the space shuttle to come and kill Connery. Mm -hmm. They take out their rifles immediately and, and, and mm -hmm. fix them up on the ground so they can easily be identified through a camera. That's stupid. Peter Boyle, the other bad guy in the film, he can get taken out with one punch, we learn. Mm -hmm. If he can get taken out with one punch, I think we sort of feel let down at the end of this picture. Well, now, in other words, you're telling me this film is not credible. At all. This is a science fiction thriller set right. on the moons of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. It's a remake of a Western, yeah. and you're telling me that you didn't, uh, it wasn't convincing. I That's don't think right. it's supposed to be convincing. Well, let me I ask think you it's this. supposed to be mm -hmm. pure escapist space opera. Okay. And on that level, I think it works very well, yeah. plus the bonus of the fact that it has a good character in okay, it. Okay, then let me ask you a question. Why did you take the time to point out the flaw if it didn't bother you. Because when flaws like that happen in films like this, they amuse me. The, I you like liked the, it. You like I like the, the fact that dumb guys come in and do stupid things. These killers mm -hmm. are stupid in every scene that they're in. That's kind of amusing. You don't like smart killers. I like smart killers in another movie. I think this movie is a lot more entertaining mm -hmm. than Take This Job and Shove It, which you've already said you recommend. I do. Okay. I like it much better than this. I think this film would have been much tougher just like High Noon, if the killers were not Dumbos, I don't think this is intended to be a comedy at all. Okay. I think this was intended to be a serious I film. I didn't say it was a comedy. I said I was amused by the fact that they were behaving in this way. It's part of the fun. I wasn't amused at all. This should have been a straight, serious thriller. They think they wanted to go after something like Alien. I don't think they even came close. <laughs> well, here come a couple of movies that we can probably both agree don't even come yep. close. Here's Spot the Wonder Dog leaping into the balcony, reminding us it's time for the Dogs of the Week, the week's worst movies. Well, my dog this week is The Fan, the story of a crazed fan who has fixated his love and hatred on a film and Broadway star played by Lauren Bacall. This is no cheapy production, but the story is as low rent as you can get. The movie simply presents this fan stalking Bacall for an hour and a half. When he can't get to her, he starts cutting up those people close to her. We see standard mad slasher attacks in bloody detail. This film is a dog because it's not about fans or stars. It's about knife attacks. You pay four bucks, you get to see Lauren Bacall squirm. It's a crude, exploitive film that is particularly disturbing because now big name stars apparently are getting into the mad slasher movie parade. Awful. Well, my dog this week is another artless and disgusting mad slasher movie named The Burning. I don't know if the people who made The Burning know the people who made Friday the 13th Part 2, but they ought to get together. They could save a lot of money on scripts because both of these movies tell almost <laughs> exactly the same story. Mm -hmm. A bunch of kids go to summer camp and hear legends about the abandoned camp on the other side of the lake. Years ago, so they say, a man was killed over there in a tragic accident, but they say he never died. His body was never discovered. He still lurks in the woods, ready to pounce on unsuspecting teenage campers. In Friday the 13th, Part 2, the avenging monster was almost drowned. In the burning, he was almost burned to death. <laughs> That's the only important plot difference between these two movies, mm -hmm. which are otherwise just a series of shots of screaming teenagers being hacked to pieces. 
if I see one more teenager cut up in the movies this summer, and I'm afraid that I will, <laughs> I'm going to start thinking of the beach party movies as masterpieces. You know, here we go again, and it's really disturbing, particularly the fan for me, because, you know, it's one thing when you see these cheapy tax-sheltered deals with no stars and people mm -hmm. just trying to break into the movies any way they can so they take a horror film. But in the fan, Maureen Stapleton, one of the great American actresses, on film or on stage, gets sliced in the head twice. Lauren Bacall is held at knife point. What's that all about? I, I tell you, it's really becoming a rotten time at the movies for us. It's sick, but you know, it's funny. The teenage audiences for these films probably don't know who Lauren Bacall and Ma Maureen Stapleton are. They'll go to the burning just as easily as to the fan, yes. as long as they see the TV ads of axes and hatchets and knives and scissors and so forth. We must have seen 25 or 30 of these movies each by now, and I'm getting totally sick of them. I hope eventually we're going to get to the end of this cycle. It won't run out this summer, though. Because well, they, the summertime is when they really come on in yeah, force. we still have some more of these already in the can. Yeah. Okay, let's recap our reactions to the main movies on this show. Roger and I agree that The Legend of the Lone Ranger is a total waste of time. A bad western and a bad children's film, needlessly violent. Two strong no votes from us. Neither one of us can recommend you see it. Two no votes also for Death Hunt, a deadly dull adventure film with Charles Bronson being chased all over Canada. <laughs> Bronson and Marvin are just fine in this movie, but the bad guys and all the supporting characters are just ridiculous caricatures. We split on Take This Job and Shove It, the brewery workers' revolt movie. <laughs> Roger thought this was a slow-paced, witless failure. He says no. I thought it was much, much better than that, especially Robert Hayes, who's excellent in the film. I say yes. And we also split on Outland, you may recall, the space <laughs> adventure film, High Noon in a Space Suit with Sean Connery. Roger enjoyed the adventure in Sean Connery. He says yes. I like Connery, too, but I thought the bad guys were laughable. I vote no. Well, so much for this week. Next time on Sneak Previews, we'll take a look at Cheech and Chong's Nice Dreams, the new sex and drugs comedy. I sent a letter to my love with Simone Signore as a woman who carries on a secret romance with her brother, and History of the World Part One, the new musical comedy by Mel Brooks. Until then, we'll see you at the movies. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations.